Hi everybody. Before we get started, let me say this will probably be the most controversial episode of the series. If you hate the idea of AA, please don't click off. I'm not going to shove it down your throat. If you love AA, please don't click off. I'm not going to ruin it for you. Just hear me out to the end. The Science of Recovery theme music. Welcome back. Every time I talk about the science of recovery, there are at least two people in the audience who respond in polar opposite ways. There's always at least one person who says, hey, that word recovery, you're scaring me, dude. You're making me think that I'm, I'm going to have to go to AA and you're going to shove AA down my throat and that's the only recovery I've ever heard of and I don't like it. I'm not listening. I'm not going to do that. And there's always at least one other person who says, hey, I found this wonderful spiritual path in my life to recovery and I have a faith that my recovery is based in and if you're going to start talking all this science stuff, you're going to take that away from me and I'm not listening and I don't want to take anything away from you either. In fact, let's grant that there is a spirit. Let's grant that it's infinite, immutable, forever. In this life, my spirit happens to reside in this meat sack and this meat sack isn't immutable, isn't forever, and certainly is imperfect. My job as a doctor and a scientist is to help other people who are locked in their own meat sack for this lifetime understand the limitations of their body and how to live with them. One of those limitations is the biological illness of addiction. And that's what we're talking about. Now, how does this all come together? Well, William White, who's an amazing historian of recovery, addiction, addiction treatment, you should look him up. He wrote a wonderful monograph on the essentials of recovery culture. And he said that every successful recovery culture has five things in common. One, it's a group because nobody recovers from addiction alone. Two, that group is horizontal. There's no permanent leader. There's no boss. People who have been in recovery for 20 years and the people who just walked in off the street, they're the same. Three, a loving mentor. Again, not a boss, no one to tell you what to do, no one to tell you to sit down and shut up someone who accepts you for where you are and who you are and uses the darkness from their own life to light the way on your path. If there's a therapist, that's treatment. That's not recovery. That's okay. That's treatment. But that's not recovery. Four, confession. And before that word freaks you out, it just means being honest with yourself and at least one other person about the things that are bothering you the most. That's all it means. You don't have to put up billboards. You don't have to shame yourself in public. You just have to be honest enough with yourself to get past what's upsetting you. And five, helping others. Now, if William White is right, that these five things are the essential core of all successful recovery cultures, then we ought to be able to find something biological that these five things work on, something that actually relieves the symptoms of addiction, or else how can they be successful? So let's take a look at that list again. First, a group, because nobody recovers alone. Do you remember a few episodes back, we had an episode called Less Than. And we talked about how physical isolation actually drives your dopamine receptor density down and takes your dopamine tone down, worsening the symptoms of addiction. Well, if you're part of a group, you're not isolated anymore. Two, that group is horizontal. There's no bosses. There's no subservient people. Back to that same episode, do you remember how the subservient monkeys had low levels of dopamine receptors and the non-subservient monkey 
had a high level of dopamine receptors, well, it turns out you don't have to be better than anyone to have all your dopamine receptors. You just have to be not less than. When everyone's the same, nobody loses their dopamine receptor density. Three, a loving mentor, not a boss, not a counselor, not someone who tells you what to do. Somebody who's saying, you and me, we've got the same thing. I may be farther along the path than you, but it's the same path. I'll show you how I did it. I'll show you where the potholes were for me. You make your own decision. I'm here for you. That doesn't make anyone feel less than. That's someone else taking time out of their life to help you. It's not going to make you feel less than. It makes you feel cared for, loved, accepted. Four, confession. Even if everyone around us in the group is treating us wonderfully, even if we're included and we're not made to feel less than by anyone, if we're harboring secrets, if we're harboring sources of shame inside of us that we're not telling anyone else, we're going to make ourselves feel less than. We're going to be lowering our own receptor density. So we tell one other person and ourselves the truth about ourselves, the truth about the things that bother us most. And once we see the acceptance in the other person's eyes, our dopamine receptor density comes back up because we can no longer make ourselves feel less than with that secret. And finally, helping other people. How can you feel less than? How can you feel alone when you're helping somebody else? It's just not possible. Now maybe you've had a bad experience with one recovery culture or another. Understand that each one of these recovery cultures is expressed by the people in the room. It's not done by trained therapists. And not everybody who goes to the meetings are there for the purest of reasons. There may be some people who attend recovery culture groups in order to lord their clean time over other people, in order to feel better than other people, in order to try to make other people feel less than them. That's not an expression of the recovery culture. That's an expression of those individuals. Now, if that has ever happened to you or happens to you in the future, remember the five core essentials of a recovery culture. Hold on to those. Take those and leave the rest. Let those people have their own problems and you get out of it what helps you. So all five of these core essential elements of a successful recovery culture all do the same thing. They keep dopamine receptors at their genetic maximum, which gives you the dopamine tone at its genetic maximum. Now that raises another question. Are there people who are so genetically constituted that they can't benefit from walking in off the street and sitting down in a recovery culture? And the answer is yes. Next time, we're going to take a look at those genetic differences between people so we can help show you how doctors can find these genetic differences and how we can individualize treatment to get everyone the treatment they need in order to find the recovery they want from addiction. I hope you join me for that. Until then, be well.